Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, Bob Sullivan with PureLine. I hope everybody's having a good day. We're going to start the, so this is our third webinar, um, but we are going to start what I feel is a very exciting discussion. Um, this really gets down to brass tacks. We have a lot of people talking about how do I take care of Legionella? You know, what chemicals do I use? What systems do I use? But then you listen to people who have the boots on the ground. For example, my uh, uh, buddy here, Greg Bova from Johns Hopkins. The stuff that I've heard this man say and the things they do to prevent um, chlorine or to prevent Legionella is just amazing. And that's what this whole presentation is about. So I, I think um, you're going to really enjoy this and you're going to find out you know, how much work um, places like Johns Hopkins have put into this and really what it takes to be a fully protected from Le Legionella. All right, so with that, Alex, uh, why don't you give us the next slide? All right, so in this section, webinar number three, we're gonna talk about water disinfection systems uh, insulation. We're gonna talk about carbon filtration, especially in the dialysis in the laboratories and the impact of chlorine dioxide. Now, let me warn everybody right now, Yes, PureLine is a chlorine dioxide company and we talk about it. And we, we do think it's superior. What you're going to learn today is not a sales pitch on chlorine dioxide. You're gonna learn all these other things you need to do regardless of using chlorine, copper, silver, et cetera. So I, I think you're really going to like this part of it. All right, Alex, next. The problem, Legionella, and everybody knows this, let's just try to bring it back up. Um, the Legionella species are intracellular gram-negative pathogens. They're commonly found in the environmental water sources. Um, there are several species, including Legionella uh, newfamilla. Sorry, I'm from Indiana, and my pronunciations on some things isn't as good as others. Um, are known to cause both uh, community and healthcare-associated pneumonia. Mortality, um, you know, it's been reported up to 40%. Um, and this can lead to unbelievable negative publicity. So we were dealing with an insurance company a few years back and they said, if you end up with Legionella or Legionnaires, whatever in your hospital, you just need to immediately, immediately block out millions of dollars for what it's going to cost you in all types, whether you think your insurance company is gonna cover it, lawsuits and just the loss of business. So it, it, it is very serious business. Alex? So guidelines for preventing, who gets the disease? All right, um, generally people that have are immunocompromised get the disease. So in these two bullet points we list out here, people get sick from the bacteria or older people, usually 65 years of age or older, people who smoke, people who have chronic lung disease. All of those are people who are immunocompromised. People who have weak immune systems from disease like cancer, diabetes, kidney failure. Um, here's what's kind of interesting. This isn't any of the slides. If you look at where um, Legionella comes from, there's uh, been different groups doing studies that are saying 25% of the infections are actually coming from somebody who came from their home, might've been immunocompromised, ends up in a hospital. Then they say, hey, you have Legionnaire's disease. I'm sure you guys all have stories. Greg, Greg, has that ever happened over in any of the facilities you've been involved with where they somebody thought they got Legionnaire's disease from the hospital, but in fact brought it in with them? Um, numerous times, uh, because we speciate what the patient has and then we compare it to what if, if we detect it in a water system. And most commonly is that these patients come from out of state and the species that are identified for that region. And so, you know, the um, background checks has been primarily um, residential uh, systems homes. Okay. So there again, there's some of the examples and there's plenty of articles written on that if anybody's interested, because um, it doesn't always start in the hospital. All right, how about biofilms? Now in, um, I think it was webinar number one, we talked a little bit about biofilms and we put on a, what turned out to be a very popular video that was made by Montana State. You're gonna see it here again today. Now, why are biofilms important? 
Um, one, because they hold bacteria. So when pieces of biofilm break off of the inside of a wall of a pipe, bacteria can travel through a faucet or a shower head where they aerosolize and they can cause and aspirate and cause a pulmonary infection. Um, so it's not uncommon if you're talking about Legion, Legionella is to talk about biofilm control. Um, you do want to take care of and have things to uh, remediate and guard against uh, Legionella disease, uh, Legionnaire's disease. But you also need to be mindful that you've got to get rid of the biofilms in your pipe. And, and for so many reasons, we don't even have to start at just Legionnaire's disease. Alex? So chlorine dioxide testing. Um, Greg, why don't you walk us through, Greg Bova, walk us through a little bit of this. So obviously you have, you have the corrosion and the coupon racks. What are you, what are you doing for biofilm um, uh, testing? Well, you know, this list actually goes back over 21 years when we started looking at chlorine dioxide. So what we wanted to do is, you know, check the effectiveness and the impact of chlorine dioxide. So, you know, we had to look at corrosion. You know, was it effective against biofilm? Um, dialysis was a big concern because they had carbon filtration, but we're adding a oxidant to a water system and they were concerned about dialysis. And then, of course, laboratories, you know, a lot of staining of slides, they were concerned about that as well. And then, of course, your labs use our um, water, so we had to evaluate the carbon source for that. And then, you know, is it effective against waterborne pathogens? And we're not just talking about Legionella, we're talking about pseudomonas, bacteria, heterotrophic plates. So, you know, th this goes back 20 years. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And were there any lessons learned when, you know, 21 years ago versus now? Any lessons learned on this, Greg? Well, you know, actually kind of surprising. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at a monochloramine system and we're looking at these same uh, measures to see it, how it compared to chlorine oxide. And so far, it's not. And so it's, uh, you know, we, we revisit the biofilm um, corrosion aspects, you know, when we get a leak, we'll send piping out uh, for analysis. And, and we'll talk about that a little later. But, okay. uh, you know, so, so these things are visited over the years. Great, thank you. All right, so this is a, by the way, the next pictures you're gonna see are one very, very clean um, hospital utility area. Um, and I believe, um, Greg Bove, this is, is this, this is one of your hospitals, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's one of our uh, newer buildings. And what I mean now is it's now 10 years old. Okay. Yeah, that's one of our older systems there. Um, so this is what a chlorine dioxide machine looks like. We're, let, let's go ahead and keep going because that's not the main focus here. Greg, why don't you run us through the controls and why you guys laid it out this way? Yeah, okay. So what we wanted to do is not just control, but also um, monitor the chemical levels in the water system. So on the lower right, you'll see a city water chlorine chemical meter. Um, what we observe is that the city chlorine levels will fluctuate. And as it fluctuates, the uh, variable speed pump to the chlorine dioxide system will go up or down. And so, you know, we use it as a measurement and also as an alarm. So if the city chlorine levels go down to zero, we're solely dependent on our chlorine dioxide. Now, above that, you'll see um, the right up of cold water chlorine oxide control and chemical metering. So what the reason why we have two meters is that cold water, you drink it. So uh, EPA has very strict rules related to consumption. And so our concerns and is related to drifting of a meter. So a meter may say you're at, you know, point five parts per million, but in reality, you can have one to two parts per million. So these meters both measure the same volume of water, same source, and that if you have a um, differential um, range exceedance, um, that it can shut the pumps down for a standby. Um, you know, and so the meter can be checked out. Is it a pump? Is it a meter? What's the problem? And then, of course, over on the right side is a monitor for the hot water system. And right below that is a sample cooler. 
And a lot of people don't know this, that, you know, the water's coming back about 110 degrees, 112, 118, depends what you run your system at. Well, the electronics in these monitors cannot um, read accurate when you exceed those high temperatures. So we put a cooler in there so that it knocks the water down on the temperature um, so that the meter won't be damaged. And so, but we only have one meter for the hot water because people don't drink hot water, you know? So, you know, but so we've got two on a cold and one on a hot. Great. Um, and Greg, and, and I, I got a question for you. This comes from Suzanne. Um, during your last 21 years, have you experienced changes in diversity or amounts of multi-resistant um, uh, resistant uh, germs in the tubes of the hospitals uh, in bio? No. Okay. And um, actually, when we go into webinar four, we go into the details of the testing. But to assure you that initially, uh, because we're trying to learn how to use chlorine oxide and, and we'll go in a little, deep, little more detail about, you know, a disinfection system is not a silver bullet. You got to do a lot of other things. But what we have done is have a very effective zero detectable level of bacteria and lesion in the water systems. Great, great, great. All right, so let's talk a little bit about water filtration and the role it plays in the whole system. Um, Greg Bova, why don't you go ahead and take this one and we're gonna ask uh, Greg Simpson to comment if that's possible. Yeah, so, you know, we're connected off the Baltimore City water supply. And so you have a lot of galvanized pipes in the mains and all that. And so you get a lot of debris and sediment that comes in. What this filter system does is filter um, anything 20 microns and higher. And basically it keeps the mud out of the water system, the debris. And it's an automatic system. It's a um, power driven back flush. And um, we put these on all of our buildings uh, that have patients and, and we haven't had any problems, but it's an attic measure to minimize the introduction of debris into the water system. And this is one of those facets beyond a water treatment system that we've done to help control waterborne pathogens. Great. Um, Dr. Greg Simpson, what's been your experience? Uh, by the way, for those that don't know, um, Greg Simpson's written a number of books on chlorine dioxide. Um, Greg, can you give us kind of a an overview of your experience on the uh, water filtration systems in hospitals? I, in my opinion, uh, filtration is absolutely essential. One of the, one of the problems in these uh, closed systems particularly is iron and uh, iron just increases and increases. And I've dealt with several systems that have a lot of iron problems and filtration is the only really the only real cure. Uh, there's a large, maybe the largest privately owned utility in maybe the United States, or at least it used to be, is downtown Houston. And it's basically the uh, provides chilled water and air conditioning and steam to uh, the vast majority of the hospitals in central Houston, the medical center. And a number of years ago, they had a real, real problem with iron. And because of the interconnectedness, it was, it took them a long time to solve that problem. And filtration was really the only way they could go. In another hospital in Lubbock, we did, uh, we, we, I was working with a guy and we set up uh, cartridge filters and they had to change those cartridge filters out routinely up front. Uh, and then as time went on and the system cleaned up, the change out of the cartridges became less and less and less. Yeah, that, we, that we, yeah she does, Greg. We had that problem at a university north of Chicago. We put our chlorine dioxide system on, on their lines. Now these were big lines. And the amount of material that came off the walls of the pipe filled up 40 foot, um, 40 foot uh, roll off a, a waste dumpster. So, all right, Mr. Alex. All right, so domestic water heaters and return pumps. And again, th this is all the nitty gritty detail of the hospital and things that you need to pay attention to. 
if you're going to control um, Legionella. Uh, Greg Bova, you want to describe your experience there? Sure. Um, so, yeah, it was a brand new building, and we had problems with um, uh, water temperatures and flow rates, and and so these pictures is the modifications that the hospital did, not the contractor, but the hospital did to make the system work. And so we, in, in short, we had um, going out to the end of run on a hot water system, you know, maybe a hundred degrees and we ran the water for 45 minutes and we were, did not approach 112 degrees. And so we did a lot of mod modifications and, and next slide will also show that and what, what some of the modifications were, but also we um, increased the return water supply. And by doing so, we now have, you know, you turn on a faucet in less than a minute, you have 112 degrees. But what does that really mean? Well, you know, treatment system or not, you know, if you have poor flow and poor temperatures in a water system, you have that opportunity of growth of biofilm in a piping system. So we were trying to eliminate that possibility of growth by improving flow rates. So Greg, let's tie that in with the next slide here, Alex. All right, so this slide is a diverter valve. And what happened is the arrow to the left is the hot water return. The arrow on the bottom goes to the hot water heater. The arrow on the right bypasses the heater. Now, one of the things that, that I found by looking at the thermostatic element that these units come with 110 degrees. Now you're trying to run 112 in a water system, uh, you know, the manufacturers push these 110 degree elements. Well, the 110 degree elements start opening at 100 degrees. What does that mean? If the water temperature is 100 degree coming back, it's gonna bypass that converter. So you will not maintain that hot water temperature supply that you want. So we went to 120 degree thermostatic element. And so when the water comes back over 110 degrees, it starts bypassing the converter. By in improving the um, flow rates, you know, for distribution of water supply, we set our converters for about 114 supply and we get about 107 return. What does that mean? All the 107 degree water goes back to the converter. So that water does not bypass the converter and that it, it stabilized the um, water supply temperature before it was, you know, plus or minus 10 degrees swing. Now it's probably a three degrees at, at the max. So it, it, it definitely is something unknown to people that this is a crucial element. In addition, that if you look at the piping, we got a two inch return, two inch going out, two inch to the converter. Your manufacturers of the heater systems has a three quarter inch return line to the converter. And what does that mean? You're not gonna get the water flow through that. And so we made a full size and it, all these little things really help the performance of keeping the system clean. Great. Um, hey, Greg, can you go ahead and comment for us on um, the chlorite monitoring plan in the domestic hot water? Uh, so Tyler Anderson um, wrote this question. What is your chlorite monitoring plan in the domestic hot water? Have you had high chlorite issues? If so, what did you do to help fix that? Okay. So, you know, we looked at chlorate monitors and just like the corn dioxide and chlorine, we haven't found an accurate monitor. So we used the glycerin green test, which is an EPA approved method of testing. And of all, all of our testing has to be EPA approved. And the reason for that is we're a licensed water treatment facility in the state of Maryland. And so we do monthly and quarterly reporting and, and chlorate is one of those important elements. What we've seen in the cold water supply, the chlorate levels run and, you know, maybe a, uh, a 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and that's at a 0.5 chlorine dioxide injection. And so, but on a hot, you know, you were having an additional injection point and the chlorate levels tend to be a little higher. So we maintain around a 0 0.5 chlorine dioxide level, but the chlorides could be 
0.4.6, but it's fine because the EPA level is one. So, you know, we're well within the limits. And if the, the plan is, if we ever exceed one, you just piece some water to the drain. So, but we haven't had to do that um, in 20 years. And so, you know, we monitor the chlorate levels um, daily and uh, we haven't seen a problem. Great, thank you. So this is one of my favorite slides and I, I should get more excited about chlorine dioxide, but you know, I, I go into a, a, into a bathroom nowadays and everybody's got the electronic faucets. And you know, I'm the idiot that's trying to get his hands perfectly underneath there so the water will run. See me doing this going back and forth. Um, and what I learned from Greg Bova was some of the issues that are created with electronic faucets. And it, a lot of it has to do, and this is when I learned that chlorine dioxide is not the only answer to taking care of uh, Legionella. The, it's a whole package. It is one arrow in your quiver. You have to have a full systematic approach. And these faucets, um, I'm telling you, it's just kind of the light went on. I go, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Greg Bova, can you talk about your programs where your staff is to run the faucets, et cetera, and how electronic faucets get in that way? Sure. So we had a brand new building um, 11 years ago. And <laughs> the, build, the building itself has probably 3,000 plumbing fixtures. And everywhere except um, utility sinks, they were going to put electronic faucets. So these faucets had a self-flushing feature. You could program the feature and they self-flush. And that's basically is to, you know, make them functional and, you know, maintain hot water in there. So, but I looked at, geez, I wonder what the growth of Legionella and bacteria is compared to a manual faucet. Well, very quickly, we found that we had a problem. And so when you, if, if you're looking at a manual faucet, you have a cartridge and that's your only source of, of interruption of water supply. So water is upstream of the cartridge, you open a um, handle to the wrist blades and then you got water flow. And so water goes around the cartridge. But an electronic faucet sink has a lot of components. So you have a, if you look at the uh, diagram on the left, you have a inline filter with basically the screen, a little check valve to prevent um, backflowing of water from cold to hot, hot to cold. Then you have an electronic solenoid valve, and then you have an aerator. Well, each one of these components, the sections between them was tested, and we found that they accelerate the growth of bacteria and Legionella like four to five times of a manual faucet. And so this information was presented to our infection control and it got to be such a big stink that it went to um, Chicago, believe it or not. Um, and there was a lot of bad mouth that this was not a scientific study, blah, blah, blah. But this was a true application evaluation. It was not a study. And so the end result was we elected Johns Hopkins not to put electronic faucets in areas that have patient use or access. So basically is all public bathrooms have the electronic faucets and everywhere else is a manual faucet. And the also important thing is, you know, the faucet manufacturers, you know, said, oh, but you're not touching handles. Well, we clean these handles like two to three times a day in patient areas. And, you know, so we did growth um, comparison and found we didn't have a problem. And the electronic faucets, it's just a suggestion. It reduces on those criminal infection rates there's no proof to that. So the addition to that is that these electronic faucets, they were gonna put aerators in all these. Well, what's aeration? Well, you know, you got Legionella in a water system and now you're aerosolized the Legionella. So in place of aerators, we have laminar flow devices everywhere. And what they essentially do is they act like an aerator, but it doesn't aerate the water and you got laminar flow. 
So, you know, so we went in this brand new building back to manual faucets and laminar flow devices, and we haven't had a problem since. That's great. Great. And this, this is what really got me into this level three. When, when I started talking to the facilities guys, uh, people like Greg Boba, saying what they do way beyond just the chlorine dioxide, I thought it was pretty powerful. Um, hey, we had a, a question out there. Um, will this, uh, um, you know, is this being recorded and will it be available? Um, I've got a person who'd like their plant facility staff to watch. And I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, Alex, um, Alex's name is at the end of this thing. And so I, I assume generally our company puts things on YouTube, et cetera, but um, chances are Alex can also make arrangements if uh, somebody wants to see it um, in a download, downloadable uh, fashion too. All right, so impact of uh, flashing water fixtures. Um, the hospitals that seem to really have this dialed in have daily flushing protocols. Um, and Greg Bova, I know you were involved at, at Johns Hopkins on this. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on Greg all the time, but he is the boots on the ground here. And you know, with me, you're gonna hear a different story. With him, you're gonna hear the truth. So let's go ahead and have you uh, yeah. uh, cover this for us. So, you know, you know, we've been testing um, for Legionella and other waterborne pathogens for over 21 years, actually. And one of the things we saw was that we had a 2% positive in our testing sites and we couldn't figure out why. So I started looking at it more deeply and realized the water in some sinks weren't being flushed. Same with the showers, because you're a patient, you may not take a shower, it's there. And you could go through five patients and all of a sudden the patient decides to use the shower and now they got to drain all this water out of the pipe. So what is happening daily in a patient room? Well, they're cleaning the bathroom. So it's very simple. Well, I turn the water on hot and cold and I clean the sink and all that. And so you're basically dumping out the bad water and replacing it with good water. And same with the shower. All the tile work is wiped down. So what harm is it to turn the water on while you're doing it? And by doing this alone, we got rid of that 2% positive sites. And so we've been doing it for, geez, I don't know, over 15 years. Wow, wow, wow. Well, that's great. All right, now we're gonna start getting into some of the dirt here. Greg, you wanna just keep going? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is a four inch basket strainer. So the water comes in from Baltimore City through a strainer, through backflow devices. So this is the water quality being received to the hospital. And this is a strainer that has about 20, 25 micron holes in it. And what you see here, and we, we had our own lab culture this filter. And what they found was a lot of gram negative bacteria, over 10,000 colony forming units. And the black was, was Legionella. And so we can test the water system from Baltimore City, not detect Legionella, but that's because it's, it's suspended and you need a lot of volume of water to, to try to find it. And you know, uh, next webinar, I'll go into the details about the culture methods, but you know, this is a prime example of what we see coming into the hospital. Wow. I'll, right. I'll, I'll continue. <laughs> yeah, you might as well. Is... <laughs> so you know, people wanna know what biofilm is. Well, this is biofilm of a copper pipe and it's a hot water pipe. And so you see all the bumpiness, it's not a smooth copper pipe. And this was also tested to see what is it. And our labs found it was biofilm and legionella. So this is just a representation of what one can see in a non-treated system. So uh, go ahead, Greg. So, thanks, Bob. <laughs> so <laughs> this here is a valve, okay, that we took apart. And because of the vo velocities are lower in piping systems, and it's because piping systems are designed for max flow rate. So you may have, you know, 500 GPM, but design, but in reality, it could be 100 GPM. And what you see here 
is from Baltimore City and galvanized piping. It's a lot of scale. It's a lot of biofilm. There's a lot of lesion. All it was found in this valve. And you can see in the left picture that little silver knob. That's a stem to a valve. So, you know, if you open up your valves, you, you very well can see this. So the other part, you know, we, we had a look at was corrosion. And so every time we get a pinhole leak, the, the, the procedure that I implemented is note where the leak is. You know, take a black marker. It's on the top of the pipe, side of the pipe, bottom of the pipe. And so over the 20 years of piping analysis done, and probably twice a year, I'll send piping out. But so I want to know, is there a long-term effect of chlorine oxide to pipe systems? And so what we found was that uh, high velocities were one of the cause. And, and what I depicted was a pipe that you can section a pipe and you can see the scarring in the pipe. It's high velocity, low velocities, you know, flux. Um, if you ever flux a joint for soldering and you don't flush that line, the flux is an acid. It will put a hole in a pipe. Um, the chlorine can cause a problem. Now, the chlorine in conjunction with low velocities is the issue. And importance about noting is the leak on the top of the pipe is that if you have a low velocity condition in a pipe, an air pocket forms on top of the pipe the chlorine will separate out of the water as a gas and eat through the pipe. So that's why it's important to understand the sizing, the velocity, and where the leak is. And so these four items have been found by our labs. There's been no direct link to chlorine oxide related to leaks. But one of the important things, yeah, it took me a long time to figure it out, but is that the biofilms, is stripped by using the chlorine oxide. And what happens is, is that the biofilm protects the piping from the chlorine. When you strip the biofilm, the pipe now it has direct contact with the chlorine. And the, the films about the um, biofilm removal and impact will clearly show that issue. And so you know, one of the things we've been looking at a couple of options and you know, for the most part is, wait till you have a leak and you replace the section pipe. That's the most cost-effective um, response. All right, so this is back by popular demand. This is some of the videos that were taken up at Montana State. This is biofilm control using chlorine. And you can see, as it goes across here, um, the um, chlorine, is trying to get rid of the biofilm, but it's not being as successful as it would, you would want it to be. Now the next slide, uh, let's see here. The next slide, this is chlorine dioxide on the biofilm. And you can see a little bit different. The, because chlorine dioxide is also a gas, it has a, a, a much better opportunity to penetrate the biofilm. And you can see from there what it did to basically strip it away. So with that, Let's take a look at some uh, pipes here. Um, Greg Bowe, these are your pipes. There was the one from earlier. That's yeah. kind of before and after you. Yeah. yeah, so what happened was we had a hot water system. It's, this is a two and a half inch diameter pipe. And so we cut a section of pipe away to inspect the pipe and we found a biofilm lesion out. So we put the chlorine dioxide system in and three weeks later, we put a coupling in, in on a pipe for removal. And we removed another section of pipe, not a brand new replacement section. It was another section that was put in the same time as the pipe on the left was put in. And you can see there's no biofilm, there's no growth in a pipe. So it, it was very, very effective removing the biofilm and the lesion on, and we, essentially we had a clean pipe. So, good information. Alex? All right, so that kind of, and we're gonna go to a, a little Q and A if anybody has any questions. Uh, webinar four, um, we're gonna talk about prevention and control measures available to reduce the risk um, of infection. Um, and we are going to, uh, really get down into some of the uh, portable water systems themselves. And again, this will be, you're gonna hear a lot more from Greg Bova because again, 
we're trying to demonstrate a more kind of boots on the ground approach to this. That uh, next uh, webinar uh, four is May 18th at 1 p.m. Now also remember, you're gonna see a slide at the very end of this. Um, anybody who has, there it is, the HP series giveaway. So Alex Whitmore uh, will be collecting the names. We don't have everybody's names, sometimes they're anonymous, but you put your name in a hat here. Um, and basically we're gonna be doing a drawing for a system that has a value of about $100,000. So um, I, I think it's a good opportunity for you guys to get if you're interested in the chlorine dioxide system, you do have to be a hospital to win because it will be going to the hospital. Um, but uh, I, I think it's uh, you know to anybody's advantage to get a brand new machine. All right, so with that, well, let's go ahead and turn it over. Are there any questions, any uh, comments that anybody has? Feel free to either click the Q&A or the chat button and we'll see if anybody has something to add to our, our meeting. Uh, Greg Simpson, while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, do you have any comments on what you saw here? No, nope. uh, other than uh, there was a question about hot water. Uh -huh. uh, and does the, the question was, does, does the use of chlorine dioxide result in a high chloride level in the hot water system? And uh, this is a question that I dealt with uh, several years ago uh, at a hospital in New Jersey. And uh, what they found was that they had to, it, it, the, the, the short answer is it all depends on what temperature the hot water system's at. The higher the temperature, the more rapidly the chlorine dioxide is degraded. But even at that, you can have trace amounts of chlorine dioxide in the hot water system and still have good control of Legionella. At least that was my experience. Uh, Greg, do you agree with that, or am I way off base here? No, you're you're close. Um, so there there was a lot of discussion about hot water systems and disinfectants, and so you got to understand, Bob. I, I I don't mean to run over, but I I'm going to answer this question. A hot water system is a recirculated system. So if you're not using hot water, the water is looped around in the piping system. And so if you turn on a shower or a hot water to a sink, a cold water makeup goes to the hot water system. If you only treat the cold water, you cannot maintain the same level of residual in a hot system as you can a cold because you're only making up maybe 10 to 15% of the volume with chemically treated water. So one of the important parts that we treat with an injection point in a cold water main, but also a separate injection point downstream of the converters to maintain residual in the hot water system, okay? It took me about 10 years to figure this out, but we found out that this gave us the ability to maintain residual levels of both the hot and cold water. Now, when you do that, okay, if you're just doing makeup water without a separate injection into the hot, your chlorite levels are very low. But once again, your chlorine oxide levels are very low. By a separate injection, because the water circulates around, your chlorite levels will be high, okay? But they, Typically, the chlorate levels, you know, it's about a third to a half of what your injection level of chlorine dioxide is. So if your injection of chlorine dioxide is 0.5 ppm, your chlorate level should be around 0.3. Well, we're seeing a 0 0.5, 0 0.6 chlorine dioxide level, but chlorate levels are 0.6. And the reason for that is, is that the water recirculates. But once again, what it, how do you respond to that? Okay, you respond to it by dumping water to the drain. We haven't done this, and you know, since we've in, been controlling with these control meters that we installed. In addition, you don't have a dependency of temperature that impacts chlorine dioxide. 
I looked at chlorine dioxide at different temperatures and found out that was not the problem. The problem was to make up water level going into the hot water system is what made the chlorine dioxide level drop. But in addition to that, if you run 120 degree hot water, 110 degree hot water, it's perfect for lesion algorithm. So if you have a lot of biofilm in a piping system, a lot of growth in a system, your chlorine dioxide would be rapidly consumed to try to kill that biofilm. So, you know, one of the things I, I didn't talk about, but I'll talk about it real quick, is that an important aspect to making an effective system is that upon startup, you do a flush remediation. And I'll go more detail on webinar four, but that is a excellent starting point that we developed here. And you'll and, and I'll talk about that in the next webinar, but why is it important to do that? But that, you know, if you have a clean system and you're injecting downstream of the um, converters, you can run at a lower temperature, but your chloride levels are well within the EPA limits. So great, great comment, Greg. Um, hey, I've got a, I got a question here also, and, and I've got a customer out in California dealing with this. Um, this comes from Suzanne. Are there experiences in the duration of chlorine dioxide in tubes that have not been used for weeks? Um, here I saw it needed 60 minutes, but how much time is needed for treatment on pipes that are not used for a long time? I've got the same situation out in uh, California. They actually have a very small outbuilding um, that has not had patients in it because during COVID, a lot of the uh, uh, bed count um, usage went down because people didn't want to come to hospitals. And so they have something that's been sitting on three and four months. Suzanne's asking the question, if these pipes are sitting, how long does it take to clean it up? And I might even uh, abate the answer by saying, um, what measurement device would say we got an all clear on those pipes? Yeah, Bob, I'm, I got a very clear answer to that one. So chlorine, if you use it to disinfect a piping system, you got to put a 50 to 200 parts per million in a piping system. You inject it at the source and in, in come into the building. You go to each fixture, you measure, do you have 50 parts per million or do you have 200 parts? And if you use 50 parts per million, the water has to sit for 24 hours. And then you flush it back down to below uh, four parts per million, which is the EPA limit, and you test it. Well, you know, so you're looking at 24 hours to try to be effective. And if you look at the contact, contact time factor, you may not penetrate the biofilm because chlorine against biofilm, the biofilm will develop a protective flare and it'll kill off the outer layer and what's on a pipe is protected. Chlorine oxide is, is a gas. It penetrates the biofilm and so kills from within. And so the chlorine oxide and will you inject it, you flush it as you're injecting. And you know, we've done this. Okay. We all right. I haven't really talked about it much, but we had a couple of patient buildings that we did not operate. And we did a flush remediation and testing before and after. And we saw some Legionella in the piping system, but after we flushed, remediated, it was clean. So you're looking at six hours, okay? Versus 24 hours, 48 hours, you, you just don't know. And so, you know, even some of the areas that we knew the patients were using the sinks or the showers that we still conducted a daily flushing. Okay, to keep the piping system clean. You know, with any disinfectants, you got to get out the bad water to replace it with the chemically treated water. So it doesn't matter what you treat the water system with, you need to make sure that it's very reactive, very quick, and be effective in killing the pathogens. Great. Very, very good comment. Thank you. All right. Here's all the contact information you need. Um, if there are no more questions, we're going to go. I have a question. Yes. Bob, this is Greg Simpson. Um, my question to Greg Bova is, what about testing? Are you going to get into that next 
seminar? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, lesion testing, chemical testing, you name it. Okay, good. Great. Well, guys, with that, thank you for staying over extra time. Greatly appreciate it. So that's the end of our meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you.